Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, this is Stephanie Hall with the ESRD NCC. I will be your host for today. Uh, this is the uh, COVID-19 professional webinar. We want to thank everybody for taking time out of their day and joining us today. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, next slide. So let me just go over a little bit about the agenda and what the call is about. Uh, today's speaker, we have Amy Goyer. She's with AARP, Family and Caregiver Expert. She's going to be talking today about multi-generational living during the pandemic. Um, all uh, attendees have been muted upon entry, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have questions or, or comments to for Amy during out during the presentation, please use the chat or the Q&A uh, that's located uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we do want to hear questions, and there'll be time at the end for Amy to answer any questions. Next slide. So what is the call about? Uh, we, we hear from different stakeholders and peers in the ESRD community who are adapting to the COVID-19. They, they share examples and provide real-world strategies for facilities to use. Uh, these, um, these are engaging in bi-monthly calls on various topics. So um, before we get started, um, this, uh, I want to do the introduction for our speaker today, uh, Amy Goyer. Uh, Ms. Goyer is AARP's family and caregiver expert and author of Juggling Life, Work, and Caregiving. A passionate companion for caregiver, she has been one her entire adult life, caring for her grandparents, parents, and sister. Amy has more than 35 years of experience working in the field of aging, and she shares her personal caregiving journey, as well as practic practical, actionable tips for caregivers in her columns and videos. She is a widely quoted media authority and regular on the NBC Today Show. So I welcome Amy Goyer. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Happy can you hear me? Yeah, I, we can hear you, Amy. Okay, great. Thank you for um, inviting me to speak today, Stephanie. I am I'm really glad to be here and talk about actually one of my very favorite topics because I think multi-generational living is um, something that's been with us for generations and generations, but it kind of comes and goes and we're kind of seeing a surge um, in multi-generational living now. Next slide. Um, in fact, 20% of the overall U.S. population actually live in multi-generation households. That's one in five people. Uh, so it's really um, it's more predominant among Asian Americans, Hispanic Latino Americans, Black Americans, and then White Americans. But it's every every nationality, every ethnicity um, has uh, some predominance of, of living in multi-generational households. Interestingly enough, young adults are the ones who are most likely to live in a multi-generational household. And I share that because sometimes people are surprised at that. But if you think about it, um, we have what we call the uh, the refeathered nest of uh, young adults who are launching but not quite able to make it on their own, and they, they tend to be staying in their parents' homes longer. Next slide. More than 64 million Americans live in multi-generational homes. 64 million. It's really quite a significant thing, and yet it's not something that's talked about that much um, here in the U.S. Uh, some people take it for granted. For some people, it's more culturally common um, for them. But for others, it, we, we need to be thinking about what are the challenges and the benefits of these living situations. Uh, the, the most common multi-generational household has two adult generations. So think about a parent and their adult children. And that was uh, the statistic I mentioned earlier. The next most common is three generations, where you have an adult uh, whose parent and their uh, child live with them. So maybe the grandparent, adult child, and that grandparent's grandchild. And that's the next most common. I think that's what people think of the most when they think of multi-generational living. And then there are also two-generation households. It might be grandparents and grandchildren. It also might be an adult and their parent. Um, my, my parents uh, lived with me, so we were a multi-generational household. Uh, in that event, and then my sister and my nephews moved in with me, and then we were uh, uh, had even more generations living in our household. Next slide. 
Three out of four people age 50 plus want to stay in their homes and their communities as they age, but 59% think that they will actually be able to do so. So they want to do this, but they're not always sure they'll be able to. Um, they, part of the reason is they don't know if they'll need care in their homes. So caregiving is part of what comes into play in multi-generational living to allow people to remain in their homes or at least their communities or living with loved ones. Next slide. Builders are responding to this uh, phenomenon. We are, we've been seeing over, especially, I mean, I've been studying this for, um, since before the last recession. And we saw kind of a surge then because there were more people who were um, needing financially to kind of bunk up together. But what we started seeing were builders who are even building luxury condos with separate suites, maybe two master suites, uh, homes with in-law suites or young adult suites, as we call them, where they may have their own little kitchen and a sitting room and a bedroom and a bathroom that's connected to the home, but separate in some ways. The uh, next gen is uh, a, a, one of the builders has what they call their next gen model. And that is uh, the most flexible in terms of having that kind of separateness, but a connecting door so that you can all be together as well. I'm even seeing multi-generational rental properties where they're starting to realize that multi, multiple generations live in these rental homes and apartments and they, they are starting to actually build for that. Um, accessory dwelling units, uh, you may have heard of ADUs or um, um, granny pods, they may be called. They're sort of separate uh, little homes that you can put in your yard that can be temporary. You could rent them. You can buy one and then sell it and have it hauled off um, so that they are nearby but still have a separate space. And we're seeing some more popularity in those as well. Next slide. Up to 41% of Americans who are buying a home right now are considering a family member for a, uh, from another generation when they do so. So they may be thinking about their older parent may move in with them. Their adult child may be with them. They may even think uh, maybe a sibling is going to come live with them. These, this is a picture of my parents after they moved uh, in the house with me. And they had lived with, uh, they had lived in Arizona and my parents um, my dad had Alzheimer's, my mom had had a stroke, and we wanted my dad to stop driving. So he said, we're not going to be stuck in this house alone. We're going to move to a senior community. They did so, and I moved from Washington, D.C. to Arizona and moved into their home so I could be nearby and help them. Three years later, they both needed 24-hour care. And I looked at buying a home that we could be multiple generations a little more easily. I looked at renting a home, looked at a lot of different possibilities, even looked at moving them back to the Washington, D.C. area with me. The most cost effective thing to do was just have them move back in their original home that I was living in with me. So that's what we did. My mom passed away a year later, but my dad lived with me for seven years. And my sister and nephews, as I mentioned, live with us for part of that time. Next slide. So what are the benefits and the challenges of living in a multi-generational household? Uh, next slide. They're, they tend to fall in, in different categories. Financial is the first thing that people think of. Again, in our situation, I had to look at what we could afford. Um, housing is expensive and um, may not be suitable for people. So it may be as someone's aging that the, the house they're in isn't safe for them, and so they move in with family members in a different location. It might be unemployment, someone loses a job, so they move in with family. Um, a divorce, uh, we also have a, people waiting longer to get married, so those young adults are continuing to live in their parents' homes. Uh, people are also living longer, and, and we can't discount that. You know, we have people living well into their 90s pretty commonly now. And so they, there, there may be more of a time period when they can't live completely independently, but if living with family, they can manage. And as I mentioned before, the boomerang kids, the ones who move out, and then they either, again, lose a job or get divorced or just can't quite make it financially, and they move back home. 
Caregiving is another big reason, as I mentioned, you know, um, we also have a lot of grandparents who are caring for grandchildren. We have uh, almost 3 million uh, grandparents who are responsible for their grandchildren. So they are have grandchildren living with them. We have children and grandchildren who care for the grandparents, that older generation. And the thing about living together is you can provide more hands-on care. And honestly, it was less stressful for me having my parents live with me, and which was surprising. Um, I was really worried about it. Yes, I had a little less freedom, but I wasn't worrying about where they were and who was taking care of them. I hired caregivers to help me. I oversaw them. I trained them. I knew what they were eating. I was, you know, completely in, uh, um, in control of their environment and helping them be as independent as possible for as long as possible. Cultural reasons are a big one. And um, for many cultures, it's just assumed that your older loved ones are going to live with you, that older loved ones are going to have a role in childcare for their grandchildren as well. So it makes sense to live together. It's kind of assumed in many cultures. Uh, it's seen as a duty and a responsibility, although people may not want to talk about it as a duty. It's just something they do out of love. But that, in fact, is what it is. Um, also, age segregation is just not natural. It, it really uh, isn't, it, 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 you know, for, as I said, generations and generations, the older generations have helped with child rearing. Everyone helps with different parts of, of running a home, and it actually feels more normal to be around people of all different generations. Next slide. So the benefits of intergeneration of multi-generational living include intergenerational exchange. And I this is a, a great love for me. I've been working in an intergenerational program for years and years. It's mutually beneficial. The Adults benefit, the children benefit, the people of the various generations can exchange um, their knowledge, their wisdom, family history can be passed on firsthand, um, sharing, you know, culturally, you know, here's what my grandmother uh, made, this is how she made tortillas, now I'm going to teach you how to make tortillas, or this is how my uh, grandmother made scalloped potatoes, and we're going to teach you how to make these same scalloped potatoes. Those are the things that can be passed on so much easier when you're actually living together. Grandparents in a multi-generational household have the ability to play a central role in their grandchildren's life. They're not just a supporting character that they see now and then. They are a, a huge part of their lives. I know my, both of my parents had their grandparents live with them at various times, and they always said, you know, they had a very close relationship with them because of that. Uh, it's also a wonderful opportunity to provide that support for young adults, to help them get their feet on the ground, get, save money, get themselves to a point where they can be fully independent. And as mentioned before, there's nothing like the one-on-one -on -one attention, the hands-on care. For children, the more loving adults in their lives, the, be the better. Uh, the better the children will actually do in life. And the same is true for our older generations. As, as we age, um, having loving, caring family around us is, is really beneficial. Next slide. With COVID-19, what we're seeing is that there are some people who are already living together and they're, you know, they're going through the quarantine together, but there also are families that we've seen who are hunkering down together. They choose to even travel to go and live you know, through the, the quarantine together. I've heard of extended families that decide to all come together. I know a lot of young adults who, for example, lived in New York City, and they said, we're going to get out of the city and go live with their parents for a while. I know um, that there are also people who have older loved ones who were independent before, and they were coming by to help them some now and then. But with quarantine, they didn't want their loved ones going to the grocery store. They didn't, they wanted to really protect them. So they moved in together so that they could still have that socialization, have that ability to interact and, you know, comp share on shopping and cooking and all of those things. Um, social isolation has been one of the biggest problems of the, the pandemic. And one, multi-generational living is one of the solutions um, to actually be together. It, it's, um, it's something where you can limit that exposure, you can share the meals and costs, 
many people have also lost their jobs due to the pandemic. And so people are again moving in together to save money, to provide housing. Um, and in some cases, people have, who are telecommuting have said, well, I don't need to be in this city. I can go and be with my older parents and I can still work because I'm working from anywhere. So it's enabled some people to, to be in a multi-generational living situation. And some people have actually taken their loved ones out of nursing homes and brought them home to live with them because of the fear of, of COVID-19 in the nursing homes. I've known some caregivers who have done that. And of course, there's childcare. We have, I've known um, some grandparents who go move in with the family because the parents are working, they're working from home, but they can't work from home and take care of their kids. Their kids aren't going to school. So the grandparents come in and they help with that education and childcare. Next slide. There are also challenges when it comes to multi-generational living. This is a picture of my two nephews and my dad. And my dad had Alzheimer's, as I mentioned. So my, my nephews and my sister lived with us for a year. And then the house next door came open for rent. So that was just truly wonderful because it's been like they are here, but they're, they have their separate space. And that's really the key thing. It's hard to not have privacy. It can be kind of intrusive. You can't get away. It's difficult to live with someone who has Alzheimer's disease. That's very, it was difficult for my nephews who are young adults. Um, they were also extremely helpful though. Uh, it, it's, it's, sometimes people feel like they've, they've lost their identity. This isn't my home, it's everybody's home. I, I don't get to arrange things the way I want to or cook the meals I want, the way I want to or, or arrange my kitchen the way I want to. So you can kind of lose a sense of, especially that middle generation of the adult child or the parent. Um, criticism is around one of the biggest complaints. I remember when a uh, parent told me that her mother was living with them and she was making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for her children. And her mother kept coming in and telling her how to make those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And it drove her insane. And she finally blew up at her mother and her mother was just shocked. She had no idea she was being intrusive. And she, you know, they, they had a good conversation about boundaries. And sometimes you have to, you know, really get down to that. People have different lifestyles. Some people are messy. Some people are cleaner. Um, some people are more organized. Some people stay up late at night. Others go get up early. It's hard to blend lifestyles, lifestyles sometimes. And many times that middle generation, the parents are kind of caught right there in the middle. Um, you can also have disagreements on how to handle the elder care. If you've got a loved one, an older loved one living with you, and you feel like, well, they're living with me, I should be making the decisions about how they're cared for. But you may have other siblings living elsewhere who disagree with what you're doing. And that can cause a lot of conflict because, you know, it's really on the person who they're living with. But other family members do care and want, you know, a say in that. Um, they, there can kind of be that sense of constant pressure. And I find that generally people kind of settle into a routine. The transitions are the most difficult times. Next slide. Other challenges with COVID-19 include that uh, we're seeing some research that crowded homes mean a higher infection rate. Someone in the home gets the infection and it spreads rapidly. And so that is really one of the ma most major concerns in multi-generational households during the pandemic. There's also a lack of guidance. Should, my, should I be going to the grocery store or not? Should my children be going to school or not? Uh, if they go to school, is it gonna uh, be more risky to my older parents who are living in my household? Uh, if I'm a grandparent raising a grandchild, I'm already in a high risk situation if I'm older and my children, my grandchildren are gonna to go to school, but there's nobody else to be with them. I'm raising them. Those are some of the challenges. Um, you, you know, that fear of um, exposing the vulnerable at risk family members, I think is one of the biggest things that goes through, especially if you've got a three generation household and the, and the, the parents are responsible for everyone. It is also difficult to isolate within a home. If, some, if one person gets sick, 
can they really use their own bathroom and bedroom? Many homes don't have that as an option. You have to share a bathroom. You know, can you really keep people separate while they recover? And that's one of the reasons that the infection rates get higher. Uh, folks with dementia are having a hard time understanding why they need to wash their hands every five minutes and use hand sanitizer and wear a mask and some of those safety precautions. So that can be a challenge. Um, the caregivers are isolated. You know, if you've been in a, in a caregiving situation where you have an older parent living with you, they are the in-person support groups aren't meeting. They generally had uh, an ability to go out and, and get a little bit of relief and a break. Um, they may not be doing that now. I know when I was caring for my parents, going to work was my respite. And I would, in the situation now, unfortunately, they both passed away now, but I would be working from home and not get that break. So I have a lot of empathy for those caregivers. And they are reaching out and finding supports online, but it's not the same as just getting out. And many caregivers are not having uh, helpers come in the home because they're afraid. They want to you know, protect themselves and their older loved ones. So they may have been getting some support in the home and now they're not. Um, this whole thing of just togetherness, just being in the same place for so many days and not getting a break. You know, you're not going to work. You're not going to, kids aren't going to school. You're not going out to dinner. You're not going to movies. You know, you may not be going to church. And um, many families are trying to avoid, you know, the large family gatherings. So it's just a lot of togetherness. Next slide. We are concerned a lot about mental health issues during the pandemic um, for everyone. But there's just high anxiety everywhere. And if you're in a, a, a multi-generational living situation, you've got all generations and everybody has some different things that are affecting them. You know, everyone's concerned about the isolation. Isolation is bad for everyone. It's, it's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's a, a, a big effect on your physical health. So now we're in a pandemic and even more people are isolated. We've always known it was bad for older adults, but now everyone's in that situation. Uh, you, you, older adults are especially concerned about their health. Many are very just terrified of, of getting COVID-19. And they may have been involved in childcare before and now no one wants them to interact as closely with the kids. They can't hug their grandchildren. Um, or they, they, they're trying to be safe. So that changes their role some. Um, for parents, you know, the middle generation, they've got work, they've got finances, you know, trying to keep their kids schooling going and um, cook and clean and do everything for everyone. Many people don't have cleaning services coming in the home like they maybe did before. So there's really a wide range of effects for that middle generation. And then for children, if they are school age, um, that whole school world is their world, and they're missing that. And in the summertime, you know, it was being with their friends and playing sports and having various activities. So they're missing all of that. Um, and that whole fear of missing out, you know, it's just even for um, young adults, that's such a huge driver in terms of their socialization. So you have uh, sometimes you have situations where both the, the parent generation and the young adult have lost their jobs or the young adult has moved back in because of the pandemic. Uh, we also are seeing an increase in domestic violence, depression, suicide. And because of the pandemic, again, people are hesitating to get treated and they don't wanna go out and they don't wanna meet with people. And while uh, online the counseling services are, are actually quite available for many people, not for everyone. So it depends on what insurance is doing. So we're trying to help spread the word that, um, you know, taking care of our mental health right now has to be a high, high priority. Next slide. So, so I want to share with you some of the strategies of how you uh, deal with multi-generational living and what are the things that you can do, especially during the pandemic. Next slide. So communication is key, you know, clear, matter of fact, open communication. 
we find that, you know, things can be bottled up and bottled up and then there's a blow up like the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And you don't want that to happen. So talking more reg on a regular basis can be very helpful. Um, it is, you have to think of what's appropriate to someone's abilities, whether it's a child or, or an, an older adult with dementia, you know, you, you want to be open and talk about things and solicit their feedback and opinions as is appropriate. Be sure and talk about change. Anything that's going to change, it's so important to lay the ground for that and talk it through and get feedback afterwards and help with those transitions. Everybody needs a lot of validation right now. You know, if, if someone is extremely worried about the pandemic and they um, just need that reassurance and that compassion, especially right now, and that could be any generation could be in that situation. The, the nice thing is that you can look at all generations as resources. So, for example, older adults have lived long lives. They've lived through a lot of things. They've, um, they may have, you know, been, in, been through all kinds of crises in the past and wars and everything else. Younger people, they can kind of share, how, what are the survival techniques? How do we get through this? What's a good perspective? Younger people, um, for example, could be helping with the technology and helping their older loved ones connect with their friends and family at a distance using video chat and that sort of thing, or finding entertainment. Um, some families like to have family meetings, and we tried that, but it didn't work too well for us. My nephews were not too into it, but what we did was we had informal interactions. We always had family dinners together, and that was our time to just talk about it, and everybody knew you could bring up a subject then that needed to be discussed um, or something that was bothering us or something that really was good. Some families actually have a suggestion box where you can put something in and say, you know, my grandson's music is driving me insane or grandma's TV is too loud. You know, how about if we get her some TV ears, headphones so that she can watch her TV and I can listen to my music with headphones and we'll all be okay. So trying to come together and communicate and problem solve. Next slide. Coping um, mechanisms, you know, we, we need to look at what are the things that help us especially cope with the isolation, but also cope with this all, all togetherness all the time aspect. Being connected with the outside world is really important. So technology uh, these days is, is a big part of coping. Whether you're a caregiver and connecting, I moderate AARP's online Facebook group for family caregivers. And we have, you know, um, almost 4,000 people in this group now who are, we are the lifeline for so many of them because they're, they're caring for loved ones and they're um, isolated and they can go on there and they can vent and they can problem solve and ask for help and advice and give encouragement. Consistency and routines are important. So especially if it's a new multi-generational living situation, how can we keep everybody in somewhat into their routines so that everybody knows what to expect that consistency is reassuring and calming. Um, being very realistic, people are only going to compromise so much. So, you know, and you're only going to fit so much furniture into one house. And uh, there are only so many rooms in the house. So trying to be really realistic and, and facilitating compromises in many different ways is so important. As you monitor change um, among the loved ones, and this has to do also with the mental health, are people keeping up with their personal care? What's their mood like? Have they have they their appetite changed? Have they gained weight or losing weight? How have, have they completely lost interest in the things that they were interested in before? Trying to monitor everyone in the household, and, and everyone can have a, a, a responsibility in doing that. I heard a story the other day about a grandchild who had noticed that their grandmother was not um, fixing her hair and putting on her makeup, which she always had done before, and said something to his mother. And she hadn't really even noticed it and realized that his, her mother was kind of, you know, falling into a bit of a depression because that was her normal routine. So they talked about that. You need to plan for the things that are going to fill you up. So plan and schedule, exercise, prayer, meditation, faith, 
practicing your faith, socializing, trying to keep up some hobbies and creativity is a really good way of coping as well. And sometimes it's just a mental escape. We've been doing these online experiences of like Airbnb experiences online that where you kind of feel like you're escaping, you, you visit another country, it's on the computer, but at least you feel like mentally you've had a break. Next slide. So as families live together, they can reevaluate how they use space. Everyone needs their own little corner of the world. I think this is the most key thing. And depending on the space you have, create that. It may be that someone gets their own bedroom. It may be that they get a bedroom and a sitting room, which is wonderful. They may have their own bathroom. It may be that what it means is grandma has her recliner in the corner of the room and nobody else sits in that chair. That's her spot. And it may be that the um, teenager has an area in the basement where they play their music or they um, uh, have their video games set up and that's, that's their space. It may be that um, mom or dad has an area where they do their hobbies or their workspace. So everybody needs to have that in one way or another. You can look at how to arrange the furniture that way. Another thing you can do in the good weather is use outdoors and um, people in and even in, during the pandemic, you know, you can be outside in your yard if you have one. It may be that you don't have a yard. You live in, a, in, a, in an apartment complex or someplace like that. So how can you how can you take advantage of outdoors in other ways? Are there places you can go and walk safely around a park, for example? People get in the car and just go for a drive. And it's funny, I've had to remind a lot of caregivers of this because they're saying, you know, oh, I used to take mom to the grocery store and that was her cognitive stimulation. And we used to go do things together and we can't do that now. Well, you can still get in the car and drive around. And that is a change of pace. Uh, you can go through a drive through get a cup of coffee, do something like that. I used to do that with my dad when he couldn't go in the grocery store anymore, do things like that. But I could get him in the car and we could drive around and it was something different and stimulating for him. You can also repurpose your rooms during the, the pandemic. A lot of people are doing this, you know. Uh, might be that the attic wasn't used much and people have kind of refixed up their attic to add more living space in the home. It might be that you create a little area for exercise because you're not going to the gym anymore. You know, you, you want to make sure, again, and be sensitive to the fact that everybody needs their own, their own thing. So for some people, exercise is really important. Every, well, it's important for everyone, but some people, that's their thing, and so they really have to have space for that. Um, consider universal and inclusive design, and I won't get deeply into this, but if families are living together, we need to know that if there is an older generation, we need to be friendly to them in terms of steps and fall prevention and lighting and uh, making sure that laundry is accessible. Um, for people who are younger, for children, um, we, we look at universal design in terms of where the light switches go. And, you know, um, we have, if you have a, a threshold ramp for your loved ones, we had one for my dad with, when he was in a wheelchair, it was also really nice for um, one of our caregivers who brought her baby over to visit and the baby carriage rolled right into the house. And, you know, we talk about curbless showers where there's no ledge to step over. And I redesigned our bathroom so that my dad could have that. But it's also nice if you're walking a big dog in there to, to give a bath. So there are lots of uh, aspects of inclusive design for all generations. Next slide. AARP has a wonderful guide. It's called the Home Fit Guide, and I really urge you, I have information there about how to copy it. You can always just go to aarp.org slash home fit, and it goes through the house room by room and helps you evaluate and gives tips for safety. So I, this, is, uh, this is one of my favorite publications, and it's free. Um, you can download it or you can order a print copy. Next slide. If you're in a caregiving situation in a multi-generational living household, uh, try to set out clear roles for everyone. Whose job is it to help grandma go to the bathroom or help her get out of a chair? Who's fixing dinner? Try to 
try not to, um, you know, especially in a, in a three generation household, I always tell that middle parent generation, if you're caring for your parents, it's not all on you. There are things that kids can do to pitch in and help, make it a family affair. Yeah, you know, if you if you actually have a schedule that, you know, remind grandma to take her pills at three o'clock and whose job is that? That's something, you know, a younger child can even do um, if it's just a, a time reminder. Always remember to care for the caregiver and that goes back to some of the coping strategies I mentioned. But it's always important to take breaks. And right now that's hard to get the help because of the pandemic. But you can um, contact the elder care locator at eldercare.acl.gov and find your local area agency on aging. Contact them, find out if there's any respite care, or other help um, that is available. People are still coming into homes. Some people are allowing that, some are not. But you can do so and, um, and set safety precautions. Uh, there's also the communityresourcefinder.org where you can put in your zip code and you can get local agencies as well as housing opportunities, et cetera. <clears throat> and there's also, I don't have it on the slide, but there's also the Arch Respite Locator. And that is, <clears throat> excuse me, Arch Respite Locator, A-R-C-H, respitelocator.org. Um, and I'm sorry, it's archrespitenetwork.org slash respite locator. And feel free to contact me if you need that. And they have um, a, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of mutual aid groups that have cropped up during the pandemic, just neighbors helping neighbors. AARP has created AARP Community Connections as a place where you can find those groups. And I'll show you that link. Next slide. Safety precautions are key. And again, I talked about the home fit guide, but also, you know, prioritize older adults and who are maybe most vulnerable during the pandemic. Be sure to keep up those precautions at home. If you've got someone in the home who's in, in a multi-generational situation, especially if you have uh, vulnerable, vulnerable older adults or those who have an illness or a disability that makes them vulnerable, be sure that the people who are going out of the home for work or for other reasons are careful when they come back in the home and that you maintain that in the home. Again, this is that crowded homes means higher spreads of infection. Uh, it, assign roles, uh, it, we have, I talked to a family the other day where they have, it's a three generation household and the kid's role is to wipe everything down every night. And they've really taken it seriously and they wipe down all the doorknobs and all the countertops with, um, you know, the antibacterial wipes in there. That's, that's something they can do. And so families are kind of trying to, to involve them. Or I know another situation, a woman who's, whose parents live with her and uh, her, that's her mother's job, her older mother's job. And, that, and though she has some dementia, she's still able to manage that. Who's going to do the shopping? Uh, again, if you have the opportunity to have separate bathrooms right now, do it. That's something that is um, not available for everyone, but even if nobody's sick, it's a good idea to do now because someone could get sick. Um, uh, of course, watch for the symptoms, get testing done if you can. Uh, I say make it fun. Is there anything fun about this pandemic? But again, trying to like the cleaning and you know, what's a, this is a challenge. How are we going to do this? How are we going to come up with different things so we can stay safe together? And always revise as needed as new information comes out. Next slide. So getting a backup plan. You know, this is big. If someone gets sick, who's going to do the backup care? And I hear this the most from caregivers, especially in multi-generational living situations. If I get sick, there's no one to take care of my loved one. And that would be a terrible situation and it can happen. So there has to be a backup plan. And it may be that you just look into the possibility of, are there any facilities, nursing homes, assisted livings around that are taking people for short-term stays? If you had to go in the hospital, could your loved one go to a facility for a few days? Is there another family member who would step in uh, is there any other, you know, situation? Are there paid caregivers that you can have, you know, uh, on call to be able to come in and manage? Could you could get a geriatric care manager who's well versed in in dealing with crisis situations and make sure they're familiar with your loved one's medications and all of those things and 
so that if you had a crisis, that geriatric care manager could step in, manage, find care, et cetera. I had one on, on call because I travel a lot for my work and when I was caring for my parents, if something happened to them and I was out of town, I wanted to make sure that someone could get to the hospital right away if they were sick, but also manage getting them care and setting all of that up. I never had to use her, but I felt much better knowing that she was there, had medications lists that were up to date, et cetera. If there's an isolation plan, um, if someone's sick, we have to separate from each other if possible. So again, figure out how you're going to do that. Some people um, have said they would, would go and stay in a hotel and have someone else come in the home to care for their loved ones. So there are different ways of doing it. Um, not everyone can afford to go stay in a hotel though. A communication plan. So when you think about the communication plan, if your loved one, um, if you, especially if you have children or you have older adults that you care for and you get sick, who is going to, to be communicating with them and keeping them updated on how you're doing? Um, if, if they're sick, how are you going to communicate with the hospital? What are the current rules around that? Can you, uh, it, you it's, I always think it's a good idea to contact the local hospitals and find out what they're doing right now. Initially, hardly anyone could go into the hospital with their loved one. Now I know of some hospitals that will allow, if a person has dementia, they'll allow a caregiver to come in because that person can't share their information or can't advocate for themselves. And some, the same true for children. So uh, just knowing what, what's happening right now ahead of time can be very helpful. And also, of course, making sure that advanced directives are in place powers of attorney for health care and finances. If someone gets so ill, they can't be paying their bills or dealing with their financial matters as well. Next slide. So some of the things that you can uh, do, we have a lot of people are getting creative about family gatherings. And you know, I always tell people, if you, especially if you're in a multi-generational household, you often have other family members. They may be also in a multi-generational household. So you need to think about are we going to have that big family gathering? The, this, this upper picture is my boyfriend and his mom and his sister who had kind of a socially distanced Easter this year, and I, they took that picture for me. The lower picture is uh, when a family who actually created a, a plexiglass kind of shell so they could go visit their grandmother in the nursing home. We're seeing some of this, you know, happening now. We're seeing outside visits, but just finding safe ways to be together. Uh, you know, we are, we've also heard of a lot of very um, infectious family gatherings where many, many people become infected as a result of one family who got together because they felt like it was family, so it's safe. That not, that's not necessarily so. Um, you, you sometimes were having the, the drive-by celebration, sending greeting cards, finding other ways to celebrate holidays, you know, I, I think most people in a multi-generational living situation are trying to be especially careful and they may say, I'm sorry, but you can't, you know, come by and visit mom because we don't want the household to get infected, but we can figure out another way to do that creatively. And of course, using technology. Next slide. Uh, some, I'm going to share some activities, some ideas that people can do in multi-generational households. You can kind of choose a theme and say, you know, we're, we're all stuck in this home and we're driving ourselves crazy. Let's have a virtual getaway, a different way of doing things, perhaps. So you might have a spa day where you actually do each other's nails and, get, you know, give each other massages or, and then maybe um, watch a yoga class on, on video and do the yoga together. You might have a, a camping trip, but it might be in the backyard. So set up a tent and do something fun in your own yard just for a change of pace. People, I know families that are doing book clubs where everybody in the household will read the same book uh, if they're able to get it, especially from a library, or they'll take turns. One reads it, passes it on, and then when everyone's read it, they discuss it. Uh, there's so many great technology options now. You can tour mu museums online at arts, artsandcultural.google.com. You can find a lot of different museum tours that you can watch together, and that's good for all generations. You can watch images of NASA uh, in space. Um, I love the explore.org live cams because it, it, it's nature all over the world, and you can just sit there and watch a beach, or you can watch 
animals and it can be very calming, but it's also really interesting to the kids um, and the older adults. Uh, I know a family where the grandchild and the grandparent, they love to watch the animals and they talk about them and the kids learn about the animals and everybody enjoys that. You can also just choose a theme destination and say, okay, this week Italy is our thing and we're going to, we've been to Italy, so we're going to look at our scrapbooks and we're going to watch a movie that takes place in Italy. We're going to read a book about Italy. We're going to uh, learn to dance, uh, a, a typical Italian dance. We're going to wear clothing of that uh, destination or we're going to cook meals that are around that theme. And that's, uh, it's something that you could do for a month, a week, every now and then. It's just something to kind of change, uh, have a change of pace. It can be a learning opportunity and it can be something fun and entertaining and cognitively stimulating. Next slide. I really urge people to maximize the intergenerational ex exchange in these situations. It's easy to take for granted. Well, we all live together, you know, it's, but maybe this is a great time to take that effort and record uh, an older adult's life story. Someone, uh, one of the younger generations can interview them and make a video or an oral, re uh, a, a audio rec recording or use an app like um, StoryCorps to be able to do that. Uh, there's, Shared activities and games, you know, you, you build intergenerational relationships with shared experiences. So try to, you know, be proactive and set up playing a game together or create doing a hobby together, painting some, doing a painting project or anything that, that is interactive. Exercising together, you know, people aren't getting out, so everybody needs to exercise and you can have um, the younger generation be the teachers and teach, have the older generations, you know, dancing or marching to music. Every generation is a resource. So look at the positives of this and, and try to have fun with it. Again, there are challenges and I, I completely know that, but I know from my experience, I wouldn't have traded it for the world to have that opportunity. Um, my dad especially loved having the younger people around and uh, you know, I, he he would light up when they were around and he would talk more. So it, 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 it's, and my nephews know that they did their part to help with my dad. And I think that's really gratifying for them because he did so much for them when they were growing up. So try to have fun with it. Next slide. I want to share with you before I go a few AARP resources that might be helpful. And then I'll be happy to take questions. Next slide. So AARP has a family caregiving website that is chock full of information. It is in English and in Spanish. We cover everything from the basics of caregiving, caring at home, which obviously is part of this multi-generational living, but also if you have got loved ones living in nursing homes, the financial issues, the legal issues, medical, health care, dealing life balance, caring for the caregiver, you know, coping skills. I write a column on the website. We have several other experts that have columns, a psychologist, a lawyer, um, and we have uh, all kinds of videos and tools and uh, publications you can order. The ARP also has a caregiving support line. And so you can call that number Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And um, th there are trained uh, agents who will help guide you to local resources or resources that AARP has. Next slide. AARP has this really great free guide that you can order called Prepare to Care. And it comes in different versions. There's English, Spanish, Chinese. We have an Asian American version, a military caregiving guide, and an LGBT version so that we have tried to gear these towards um, the needs of, of the various populations. And you can just go to aarp.org slash prepare to care, or you can call that toll-free number and ask for a copy, or you can download it from the website um, or, or, or get a print copy. Lots of ways to get it, but it goes through all the steps that you need to go through in planning and being prepared to care for loved ones. Next slide. ARP also has a lot of different ways to connect, um, including a, a life balance section of the website. We have a, an online caregiving community where people can connect um, and we post a lot of tips in the community. 
And as I mentioned before, I moderate AARP's Facebook Family Caregivers Discussion Group, and I'm in there a lot. We have, you can ask any kind of questions. We have a, a many, many people who are living in multi-generational living situations in the group as well. Next slide. Uh, we do have a lot of information for veterans, and I'm kind of on a mission on this. My dad was a veteran, and the VA were extremely helpful to us. And so I really want to encourage people to uh, remember that if your loved one's a veteran, they may be getting a eligible to get some support, some services. My dad got financial assistance as well as home health aids and home-based primary care, et cetera. And you can order that military caregiving guide at aarp.org slash veterans. Next slide. We've also come up with a lot of resources around COVID-19. So we, this is a fact sheet we have in, in Spanish and English um, called Preparedness for Caregivers. Just talks through those five steps of ways to be prepared. Um, and as we head into fall and there's lots of speculation that the pandemic will get worse again, we are really trying to get this out to people so that they are as prepared as possible. Um, you can download it from our website. And if for any reason you want print copies, to be distributed, um, get in contact with me and I'll, I'll put you in contact with the right people. Next slide. We have um, aarp.org slash coronavirus and AARP is constantly putting up new content there. Everything from a, a lot on telehealth and helping people navigate telehealth since this is a new kind of becoming a new normal. We have videos and articles and all kinds of up-to-date information how to deal with mental health issues, staying home and you know what, what to do at home. Scams and fraud have been a huge uh, focus for AARP around the pandemic because we've seen a big surge in, in all kinds of new scams. So we have great information there. We have a Fraud Watch Network you can sign up for. You can report fraud there as well. We talk about work issues. Um, many of us have had a lot of changes in our work because of the pandemic. Dealing with financial matters, we've had a lot of information on the stimulus checks and that sort of thing, your insurance, everything. And AARP is having regular teletown halls and, and videos where you can um, log in or they uh, and call in and listen to experts from around the country talking about the pandemic. Next slide. We also have Community Connections, which I mentioned earlier. So Community Connections was completely created because of the pandemic. It was AARP's quick pivot and response. And it's just aarpcommunityconnections.org. And it's a place where mutual aid groups can list themselves so that people can do a search and find one. And these mutual aid groups are generally people in the community who are saying, gosh, what can we do to help each other? And um, so they are doing things like running errands or going to the grocery store, or helping someone in their yard or, or you know, anything that they can do for each other. It's, it's really uh, grown fast and it's, it's been an amazing response to that. Part of that effort is AARP started a program called Friendly Voices. And you can sign up um, to get a fr friendly phone call from a trained volunteer in English or Spanish and they volunteers make one-on-one -on -one phone calls. And one of the things I tell people, especially if you're in a caregiving situation, if you've got an older adult in the home, you may not think of it, but it, it's kind of a lot of pressure on you to always be interacting with them. If you can arrange to have someone else to call them on a regular basis, and you just have somebody else to talk to, it kind of frees up the caregiver generation in the situation. So uh, this is something that I urge people to check on and sign their loved ones up. Next slide. So this is my contact information. If I've shared anything today and you wanna double back with me and, and find out about it, please feel free to do so. Uh, you can always reach me at amy at amygoyer.com. That's my email address and I'm all over social media. So you can find me one way or another. So I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. 
Well, thank you, Amy, for that excellent presentation and especially sharing your personal experience with your parents living in a multi-generational house, household. That, that was very, very nice of you. Um, we do have a little bit of time for a couple questions that I'll jump into. Um, I think it was earlier on you talked about uh, rise in domestic violence and with the mental health, depression and suicide. Um, do you have any statistics or do you know has there been a rise in that uh, since the COVID-19 has started? Yes. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the statistics at my fingertips. But there, I have seen studies that there has indeed been a rise, um, a rise in suicides, especially among older adults, um, a, a rise in um, mental health issues, depression, and anxiety. But I'm sorry, I don't have statistics on that. But um, I think it'd be pretty easy to find. You can, can Google um, or contact me, and I'll send you some things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't mean to say that lightly. I mean it's it's. We kind of uh, we kind of anticipated that would be the situation, unfortunately, and especially with domestic violence, because people are stuck at home. And the mm -hmm. usual outlets, um, we've also seen a, a rise in people who are, are drinking too much alcohol or doing drugs that they right. weren't doing before. Right. And I do want to, um, you shared a lot of resources, and I just want to reassure the attendees that these will, these, the slide deck will be posted to the NCC website. <clears throat> um, in about three days. So if they were trying to hurry and write all this information down, please uh, don't worry about it. Uh, you can go to esrdncc.org in about three days. Her, her slide deck will be there as well as the audio uh, recording uh, that you can go back in and get um, this information. So um, Amy, we do have another question here. It says, uh, how do you begin the talk with your parents to suggest them moving into a new home or your home as they begin to age and have increased health and physical needs? That's a really common question, and it's one of the <laughs> hardest things to do. Um, you'll find if you Google my name, Amy Goyer, Difficult Family Conversations, you'll find I've written about this, and um, I believe I've talked about it on the Today Show before. It, it is one of a, a tricky thing, and this particular difficult conversation about changing the living situation is, is, is especially difficult. Driving is the other big one. Um, that it, that's really hard. But if you're looking at the love, your loved one's um, abilities, so first of all, whenever you have these conversations, it's not about age. It's not about age. Don't say, well, you're older now, so, or you're over the age of 70 or 80 or 90 or whatever, because everyone's abilities are different, and you can't really base it on age. So, so I would not recommend starting with that. Uh, instead, talk about um, things that you've observed. I always say do your homework before you have these conversations. So one of them is to observe things. Mom, I've noticed that you're having a hard time keeping up with the yard work. Would you like some help with that? Or maybe living in a different place where there's not as much yard work. Um, that was one of the things that you know, my dad, I know, had been struggling with. Um, Mom, I, if, if you're talking about driving and, again, like my dad didn't want to be isolated, it, it, I had, you know, there were dents and dings on the car, his vision, he was having visual issues, and that was really the main reason we wanted him to stop driving even more than the um, Alzheimer's. I had some very specific incidents and things to share with him, and not in an accusatory way. You don't want to get people on the defensive, but you can say, okay, so I'm starting to see some changes, and I want you to be as independent as possible for as long as possible. That's really the key thing. We're all on the same team. We all want you to be as independent as possible for as long as possible. So don't think I'm trying to take away your independence. I am trying to um, ensure that you can be safe and healthy as possible and as much independence as possible. And that might mean a change in living situation. But the truth is, if you stay in your home and you're not safe, then you're not going to be independent, or you might fall and break a hip, or you might end up in a facility that you don't want to live in. So let's make some smaller changes now so that we prevent those things from happening. Think about who right. needs to be part of that conversation, too. That is really key. If, you, if there is a certain family member, the doctor, a lawyer, the financial accountant, whatever the issue is you're discussing, that, that your loved one trusts and 
would be more amenable to the, the conversation, then make sure they're a part of that conversation. And also think about when to have the conversation. Uh, in the middle of a pandemic might be the best time because you can say, hey, let's all, we're going to be isolated for a long time. Maybe now's the time to make that change so we can all be together. Might be a great time, or it might be the worst time, depending on your loved one. It might be that they're, they're panicky about everything and that would be too much change. So you know your loved one, take those things into account. I mean, even think about when during the day you should have a conversation like this. Are they better in the morning? Are they too tired at night? Are they better at night? Think about all of these aspects. And again, do your homework. You don't come up and say, mom, you need to move. Um, well, where do you want me to move? I don't know. Look at what the possibilities are. Here's what would happen if you moved in with me. Here's another place you could move. We could buy a house together, you know? Come to the conversation with that ammunition, if you will, that, that homework that you've done. And be compassionate, you know, come at it with love. You're, again, you're all on the same team. Um, at, you know, validate their feelings. Ask them how they feel about it. Ask them if they are, are sometimes feeling a little overwhelmed in their home. Um, ask them if they feel safe going down those stairs to do the laundry, you know, try to get, you get it be a conversation, not you coming in and dictating. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. And um, Amy, it is uh, right at four. So we are going to wrap it up again. Uh, thank you, Amy, so much for taking time out of your day to uh, present to us. We really appreciate that. So I'm just going to close it up for everybody. I uh, just want to mention again, you might have came on early and to see our video at the beginning, but the Kidney Learning Hub, <clears throat> it's a secure mobile-friendly web tool for patients and professionals. It was developed by the ESRDNCC with assistance from patient subject matter experts. A lot of information on there, talks about COVID-19, infection prevention, transplant at home, um, there's also new features on there about the patient grant library, and so please visit that um, and mark it to your device's home screen. Next slide. We also have a uh, kind of feeds into this, the COVID-19 mental health tool toolkit. It's out on our website again. You can download it. It's uh, helping renal professionals support the well-being of the ESRD community. So it has some good tips and uh, tools in there for you to use. Next slide. And again, um, we have a patient and provider uh, COVID-19 webinar. The next patient one is September 26th at 4 p.m. The next professional focused event is September 30th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you can go to the next slide, uh, it will be uh, uh, organ donation impacts of COVID-19. We have a guest speaker who is um, the director of LifeLink, an organ procurement organization in Florida, going to be discussing how they are dealing with the impacts of the COVID-19 for organ don donation during this time. And next slide. And I think we just want to thank everybody again for taking time out of their day to join us. <clears throat> and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you, everybody, and take care.